Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to our panel discussion uh, on the situation of um, the freedom of the press in Malta here at um, RSF Germany, Reporters Without Borders Germany in Berlin. Um, and a warm welcome to our guests tonight, um, Caroline Muscat and Rebecca Vincent. Um, Caroline Muscat is from Malta. She is uh, the founder and managing editor of um, The Shift, which is an online investigative um, news portal in Malta. And before that, she worked as a news editor um, of uh, the Times of Malta and the Sunday Times of Malta. Um, she basically focuses uh, on the topic of corruption in her work. Um, and she contributed to and co-edited uh, a book um, about Daphne Caruana Galizia, um, a fellow journalist <coughs> from Malta and a friend of Caroline's, who, as you may all know, um, was assassinated in Malta in October 2017. Um, Caroline was awarded um, the Press Freedom Award from, from us, from Reporters Without Borders, two years ago um, in 2019, among several other awards. And at the moment, Caroline is here with us in Berlin for a couple of weeks as part of an um, RSF scholarship. And with us is also <coughs> Rebecca Vincent, uh, also from RSF. Um, she is our director of international campaigns and also the director of our UK um, office in London. And in that capacity, she has traveled to Malta many times uh, in the last uh, four years to show solidarity with uh, journalists in the country, with um, the family of Daphne Caruana Galizia, um, but also, obviously, to, to monitor the, the process uh, being made or often uh, not made in the murder investigations and also in the public inquiry that was um, established to, to investigate uh, the circumstances that allowed the murder to happen four years ago. Um, so, a small introduction on uh, what we're going to talk about this afternoon. Um, as I mentioned, on October 16th in 2017, um, yeah, it was basically a day that shook Malta to the core and also drew um, uh, international, um, yeah, it kind of changed the, the way the international community looked at Malta, which is a small island in the Mediterranean that many of us uh, didn't know much about, I guess. Before, um, on that day, on October 16, uh, 2017, uh, Daphne Caruana Galizia, an investigative journalist, was murdered with a car bomb not far from uh, her own home. Um, she was murdered for exposing and denouncing corruption um, and nepotism right up to the highest levels of government in Malta. Um, this year only, um, that is, yeah, almost four years after the murder, in July 2021, um, the final report of the public inquiry came out. Um, and it said that the state, um, the Maltese state, has to shoulder responsibility for Daphne's death by creating um, yeah, a pervasive um, atmosphere of impunity. Um, before her death, um, Daphne had to live with... Um, yeah, with an immense amount of hate and death threats for many years. Um, and at the time of her death, there were still 47 defamation cases, uh, or so-called slaps, pending to, uh, against her, and some of which her family still has to deal with after her death until this day. Um, after the murder, um, several right-hanking politicians in uh, Malta, including the Prime Minister, Joseph Muscat, uh, had to resign. But still, the toxic atmosphere that journalists have to face in that country still hasn't uh, changed until today. Um, so critical journalists um, are confronted with a climate of hatred uh, by, by leading political forces and also by an army of internet trolls. I guess we are going to talk about that uh, later in um, the hour that we are going to talk about this. Um, on our RSF World Press Freedom Index, uh, Malta is ranked only 100, uh, 158th out of 180 countries. And from 2013 until today, Malta has dropped um, by 36 places. So um, one can say that uh, yeah, the situation has um, 
uh, has worsened over the last couple of years. Um, so my first uh, question goes to Caroline. Um, working as a journalist yourself, what are the main obstacles that journalists have to face uh, in Malta nowadays, especially if you work in a field like um, corruption or um, abuse of uh, political authority? The challenges that journalists face in the country are a result of the media landscape in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, Malta, despite being an EU member state, um, has, a lead, uh, has a media landscape in, where that is dominated by the um, two uh, political parties. The, so so there, is very, there are very few um, independent newsrooms in the country. Um, and as the situation has become more difficult, then there has been a, a concerted effort to, to control even those independent voices. So when we talk about in the independent um, journalists in the country, there are very few. Um, when you talk about investigative journalists in the country, there are even fewer. Mm -hmm. um, since Daphne Caruana Galicia's assassination, uh, we have uh, made a massive effort to, uh, let's say, modernize um, the way that we do journalism as investigative journalists. And that is mostly through collaborations with international newsrooms. Mm -hmm. um, because Malta is a hub. And the more we dig, the more we realize that that is true. So um, apart from uh, the corruption that we deal with in our own country related to massive deals, Malta also serves as a hub for money laundering, for example. So there's a lot of flow of money that goes through our country. So um, on top of you know, addressing our own situation, we have to help journalists in other countries who are, who are looking into these things to understand um, how Malta helps these flows and what uh, we can do uh, uh, on a Europe-wide effort to, to address the situation. Because we are few in the country who, 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 tackle, who tackle these, these, these topics, um, it, is, it is very easy to isolate us, to ignore us. Um, the, as I said, the, the party in government particularly dominates, dominates media ownership, including the state broadcaster. This mm -hmm. is confirmed by several studies done internationally. Um, and therefore, um, as a result, dominates press coverage itself. Mm -hmm. So, despite, you know, sometimes stories take weeks and months to investigate, um, when we do publish these stories, it is very hard to go against the current of, of what the dominant narrative or the dominant discourse is. Mm -hmm. And when we do expose something that is uh, extremely hard hitting, then there is a, an, an army of, of, of trolls on social media mm -hmm. um, that we have discovered through our investigations to be directly connected to the party in government, mm -hmm. um, built over seven years, managed, managed and administered by people working in the justice ministry and the education ministry. Um, we have exposed all of this um, and, and we presented uh, our findings to, um, to the panel of judges that conducted the public inquiry, which we will go into, I guess, at a later yeah. stage. But um, one, one very, very important aspect that we have discovered in these four years since Daphne's death is that the best tools that we have to protect ourselves against you know, um, the climate of hate mm -hmm. um, that, that we face is to use the invest our investigative skills mm -hmm. Um, th that is the power that we have, the power to publish, the power to inform the public of what's going on um, and to continue to expose, even when we're hit by slaps, to continue to expose um, the, the truth, um, the facts uh, in the story. That is really the best defense that we have found uh, in terms of protecting ourselves mm. um, in, in this climate. Mm. What about the mainstream media? Do they pick up on these stories, or does rather yeah, kind of backlash come from them if you uncover stories like that? Most of the mainstream media is owned by the political mm -hmm. parties, so they either ignore you completely, or or 
um, or they target you. We have, I mean, for example, when we expose stories, it is, I mean, very often my face is on primetime news. Mm -hmm. um, this is this is the one she's, uh, I've been called a political op operative. Mm -hmm. I've been called all kinds of names and this is, by 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 a TV station owned by the party in government. Mm -hmm. um, now each um, as as a party, it has online news portals, radios, daily newspapers, Sunday Sunday newspapers. Mm -hmm. So so it's it's very hard to fight to fight back mm -hmm. against that. Mm -hmm. But we um, at the shift we built a different model, in the sense that we are community funded, mm -hmm. um, and that has enabled us to build. To build a network, um, and and you know our readers are constantly informed um, on what we are facing. So um, while we can't, you know, possibly fight a machine as strong as the government, mm -hmm. we we have built a very strong network that has our back mm -hmm. um, when 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 we are exposing these facts. Mm -hmm. um, before Daphne was killed, she also had to face an. Um Yeah, an outrageous amount of hate towards her for actually for for many years, but uh, it's uh, really accelerated in the months before her death. Could you give um, some examples or maybe explain how how that yeah it, it was a campaign how that worked? When when Daphne was killed, it was first of all a real a real shock um, um, to the nation. Um, we never expected that a journalist uh, could be, could be killed. We we are very used to working in a in a divided in a divided, highly polarized um, society that is that is stoked and provoked by by the by the parties and, and the political party uh, situation in the country. But we really never expected that a journalist could be killed in the mm. country. So that was a wake up call. Mm. That was a wake-up call. I set up the shift three weeks after her assassination because we felt that we had to send a message back to the perpetrators, that you can't kill one of us, that, that, you know, that, that we, were, we, were, we, were, we were taking a stand and not, and not accepting that. And it was also important to send a message that um, even if you kill a journalist, you don't silence the story. Uh, Daphne was working on a number of, um, uh, she was investigating a number of stories related to corruption. Um, it is now very clear um, that she was killed um, specifically to be silenced on, 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 a, on an investigation she was conducting on, a, on an energy deal in the country. Mm -hmm. So we have picked up, the, in the last four years, we have picked up um, the key, the major investigations that she was working on. And we have continued to dig deeper, to get to to to, to make sure that you know the, the facts that she was killed for, um, the, the the reason why she was killed, the reason that, to, to silence her. Then then we said then we we have over the last four years um, um, brought these more of these facts forward related to the deals that she was investigating. We did this with the support of international press freedom organizations and international newsrooms. Mm -hmm. <coughs> none, of, none of the efforts we have, we have made in the last four years would have been possible without international support. Mm -hmm. So um, it is very important that I express my gratitude to the journalists and other newsrooms and to the international press freedom organizations, including majorly um, reporters without borders because it has given us the strength and the platform to move forward on the stories. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the um, v first investigations that we did, um, on top of dealing with the story she was investigating, was to look, was to try to understand how, how um, she was made a target, mm -hmm. um, how she was dehumanized and isolated. And we found that Uh, we found secret online groups uh, in Facebook, on Facebook, <coughs> excuse me, that were um, set up by the party government, as I said before. Mm. But we realized they, they, that they totaled some 60,000 members, which in other countries may not be much, but in Malta it's about 15% of the electorate. Mm -hmm. So it's incredibly significant. And we, we noticed the patterns, so we studied this, we collected the data over six months. 
<coughs> excuse me, and then he presented this to the panel of judges. Mm. And they concluded, and this helped seal the central verdict that um, political propaganda played a major role in her assassination. Mm. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. And there's also a glass of water. Yes, there. I'm going for it. <laughs> <coughs> um, <coughs> Rebecca, uh, Caroline has um, uh, said quite a lot now about um, um, investigative journalists like herself and, and their work on, um, yeah, to, um, to continue the work of, of Daphne and how that uh, helped to, to shed light on, on the backgrounds of her own um, murder. What, um, yeah, what, what was your uh, impression when you traveled to Malta well, quite a few times in, in the last uh, past four years? Um, yeah, the, the main findings uh, were made by, um, by journalists and by press freedom organizations and not really by the... Um, uh, by the criminal investigation and by, uh, wasn't it? Well, for some time, yes. Um, but we've seen, um, it's important to note, there has been now some mm -hmm. progress in some areas of this case, both on the official side and in other ways as well. Um, I think the entire time prodded along by international pressure, mm -hmm. by the continued visibility on, on this and, and by the continued work of Caroline and many others on the ground, both in terms of investigations um, in their own journalism and Daphne Caruana Galizia's family and their sort of efforts mm -hmm. to campaign and to keep us all on track on this case too. It's worth noting that in the criminal case, there have now been seven arraignments um, mm. of people connected uh, to the murder of Daphne Caruana Galizia. One alleged mastermind, Jorgen Fennec, who um, he is behind bars at present. Mm. The compilation of evidence against him continues. It's been going on for quite some time. Mm. I've been out a few times to monitor sittings in, in that. Uh, and we hope that he will be brought to trial at some point in the new year. Mm -hmm. um, there are also others um, connected to the case. Um, self, <laughs> one self-confessed middleman came out and testified. Um, there are uh, people that have, have now uh, been arrested in connection with supplying the bomb and mm -hmm. other you know, sort of middlemen and hitmen. Yeah. So seven so far. We don't know if that is the full picture, but th there has been progress in these seven cases, mm -hmm. and we hope that all of those individuals will be brought to full justice. So when we talk about full justice, that means criminal justice. Yeah. Um, the public inquiry was a really significant, significant development as well. We mm -hmm. referred to this as a landmark development, in fact, because if this is implemented properly, it could serve as a model for other countries. Mm -hmm. um, Could you maybe elaborate uh, what, uh, what the aim of this public inquiry was, sure. what a public inquiry is in the first place? Yeah, sure. So it's, um, it's not a legal process in and of itself, although, although it examines legal aspects as well. Um, it was based on, on a model from the UK, to be honest, and it in itself is a campaign victory because the former administration of Joseph Muscat fought this at every step. Mm -hmm. It took about a year and a half of campaigning, um, really concerted campaigning, I have to say, um, primarily at the Council of Europe and in, in other areas as well, um, to even secure the establishment of this. Mm -hmm. And at every point there was, you know, really close scrutiny was needed when, when they suggested the initial board of inquiry, there were problems with the composition, et cetera. Eventually, an independent board of inquiry was established. They were able to conduct their work fully and mm -hmm. independently and robustly, and we warmly welcomed their work. Mm -hmm. Uh, Reporters Without Borders engaged in that process. We gave testimony to the mm -hmm. public inquiry. Our, our colleague Pauline Addis Meville testified in person mm -hmm. in July 2020 because she had worked on Malta prior to Daphne's assassination. And so mm -hmm. she was able to give testimony on the climate and the warning signs that we saw running up to this. And, and in our perspective, there were clear warning signs that this mm -hmm. could happen to Daphne and this was preventable. Uh, we also joined a joint submission with a number of other international NGOs, uh, a written submission to the public inquiry. Mm -hmm. And uh, the findings came out in July July, over 400 pages. Um, in fact, the full English translation has only very recently been made possible, made public, because um, mm. it was initially only in Maltese. Yeah. Um, it's very strong. It mm. took into account all of these things that Caroline has detailed that we knew were happening to Daphne in the run-up to her assassination and the climate in which she operated. Um, and it found that the state had responsibility for this climate. Mm. It found a kind of um, concerning spread of influence as well from, I, I think the language was like, it spread like an octopus yeah. from the of mm -hmm. office of the prime minister throughout other governmental institutions. 
Um, and there's some very strong recommendations in the report, not just about moving forward in this case, but really importantly, um, how, how to ensure that this doesn't happen to others, because this was always one of the primary aims. This inquiry was aimed at, at establishing whether the state knew or should have known about what happened to Daphne, whether they could have acted to prevent it and save her life, and uh, what lessons can be drawn for the future. Because mm -hmm. journalists still working in Malta do so at great risk, especially journalists like Caroline who are plugging away on the investigative side. There are really only a handful of journalists. Some others uh, have often had, you know, also had to leave the country for some time. Mm -hmm. um, we hear about low level threats and higher level threats. I mean, the climate that we hear about when you go and interview journalists on the ground in Malta, even not just investigative reporters, even kind of news reporters, mm -hmm. there's there's sort of an acceptance of this pressure as normal because mm -hmm. this is just the, uh, the environment in which they operate. But when we come in internationally and look at this, we can see that actually journalists should not be working in this way. Yeah. Um, I want to be really clear about one point which we raised directly with the Prime Minister a few weeks ago in the country, which is it's our view at Reporters Without Borders, and this is shared by a number of other organizations that we work with, that at present the climate has not improved enough. There have not been any real reforms to mm -hmm. where this could happen again to a journalist still working in Malta. What happened to Daphne could still happen today. Robert Ubele, the Prime Minister, disagreed with us, uh, mm. but our position is very, it's based on evidence, it's based on our uh, in-depth research over a number of years in Malta, mm. and it's the expert opinion, again, of, of others that we work with as well. So that's really alarming, because the last thing that anybody wants, including the last thing that the current government should want, is for this to happen again. Mm. So. At the moment, we are working to ensure that the public inquiry recommendations can be implemented properly. Mm -hmm. That will start with the, uh, the establishment of an actual independent commission that will be responsible for overseeing the impl implementation of this. Mm -hmm. It's really important that everybody appointed to that body is independent and reflects the expertise needed for this body. So mm -hmm. at the moment, uh, there are apparently negotiations ongoing about who is to sit on that board. We are scrutinizing that very closely because if it if it, is not, um, if it is not kept in the spotlight, we're really worried that what mm -hmm. could come out of this is not uh, going to be what the public inquiry intended. So it needs to be both kind of fulfilling the recommendations and the spirit of the public mm -hmm. inquiry. Yeah. Um, could you maybe give some, some examples on, on the, um, of the recommendations of the public inquiry, what needs to ch change so that there's... Um, yeah, a safe environment to, uh, for journalists to work in? It's about a establishing a safe and enabling environment mm -hmm. for journalists. Actually, Caroline's probably a bit better on some of the details of it for me in terms of what would help, practically speaking, working mm -hmm. journalists in Malta. Yeah, I mean, for us... Um, to start off with, I'm often asked whether, I, whether I'm, an, I'm a campaigner, or I'm an act whether I'm an activist or a journalist. Mm -hmm. And I always have the same line, that we have no choice anymore. Because without um, the full implementation of the public inquiry findings, we, um, we are, we're not able to do our job in the real sense of the word. I mean, we can all be reporters. We can all, you know, go to the government press conferences and report what the prime minister said, but that mm -hmm. is not journalism. Yeah. So, so um, we, certainly, we certainly cannot let this report kind of gather, gather dust in, in, in some cupboard mm -hmm. somewhere. So um, we have to, with, with everything that we have, push for the full implementation of the, of the, of the recommendations. Um, there are, um, they're, they're very broad, they're, they're really wide ranging. Um, they go from amendments to the constitution um, uh, to, uh, to recognize um, uh, press freedom, um, the role of journalists as a pillar of democracy, mm -hmm. to the relationship between business and government, um, to, for example, creating a special unit um, within the police for the protection of journalists, mm -hmm. because we have had problems, for example, even when we, ha we are harassed or threatened, um, we, we, we go to the police station to file a report and the report is not taken. Mm -hmm. So we're dealing with, with, with something as basic at, as that level. Yeah. So from where we are to where we need to be is a mm -hmm. huge jump. Um, and, and we are supporting um, the recommendation of the family and uh, international press freedom organizations that says, you know, um, set, up, set up this independent commission and then we can all work together to make sure that things are implemented. Mm. Um, the, 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 the challenge is obviously to make sure, um, as Rebecca said, that they're independent when, when um, we, we, have, we have quite a skill in the country for, you know, um, ticking the boxes on paper, mm. but in practice not doing much about it, mm -hmm. um, simply because, you know, the government 
puts its own people there, mm -hmm. and and then you know um, we we have a way of getting around things. But but there is there is there are no games to be played um, when it comes to this issue because. Um, as a, for as, as a starting point, we really must make sure that you know Daphne did not die in vain. Mm. That there must be there must be a, a positive outcome, if if it can be called such, out of such a horrible situation. Mm. But at least something must change. So we are absolutely determined that that this change happens, um, and that is thanks to the really the the, the efforts of the of the family. Mm. They've, I mean, they've been campaigning from day one. They have, they've never even had the chance to mourn. Mm -hmm. um, really, from day one, there's been a battle to fight, even from, you know, when they went to court and the magistrate that was there to, 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 to conduct the investigation. They've had to fight from day one. Four years down the line, they are still fighting for a positive outcome mm -hmm. um, from such a brutal, brutal act. Um, so, so... In terms of how that would affect what we do day to day, it would elevate also the standard of journalism in the country, mm -hmm. um, because um, the this the situation, the, the the media ownership, the media landscape that we have in the country has been has always been like that since mm -hmm. Malta's, you know, Malta's quite a young republic, mm -hmm. so it's been like that for a very long time. So people know no different. Yeah. Um, there's very little media literacy. There's very little understanding of, you know, um, what real journalism is. Mm. They kind of sit there and expect the political party to tell them what to think. Mm. It's 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 almost tribal, it's mm. tribalism. Yeah? Mm. So so we have a long way to go. Mm. Um, so there's yes, the legal reforms that need to be done, and then it is our duty as journalists also to invest in this, in educating the public on what journalism should really be, mm -hmm. um, what they should expect of us. They should yeah. demand more out of us, mm -hmm. and 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 that is why it is so important. As um, with the shift, we've done it from day one to have one leg in Malta and one leg internationally mm -hmm. to make sure that we abide by international standards, that we always continue to improve ourselves, and and to to as much um, to do what we can to elevate the level of journalism in the country. Mm -hmm. so, something that's become very apparent in our campaigning over the last few years is every time that international attention fades, there is regression. Uh, or progress stalls. And so mm. every time we get anywhere, it's really mm. important then that the international community sustain that and hold Malta to account on an ongoing basis mm -hmm. or else everything that we've achieved in the last few years could be lost. So at the moment, um, the international group of NGOs that works together on this is very much just singularly focused on that, the public inquiry. Those two principles which Caroline mentioned, um, which the Prime Minister is not yet acknowledging and all of his rhetoric about the public inquiry, which is that the media is the fourth pillar of democracy mm -hmm. and that there is a need to create the safe and enabling environment for journalism. It's those two things. Mm. Um, five of our NGOs went back to the country just a few weeks ago to mark the four-year anniversary of Daphne's assassination. So we did meet with the Prime, the prime Minister then and, and other stakeholders and other officials. Um, we offered the Prime Minister technical assistance, mm. should it be needed. He has yet to take any of our organizations up on that. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we then briefed a, uh, a committee of the European Parliament on these same issues, and uh, Robert Abella was also present. And you know, we, we did point out that in the weeks since we had met him, it had been about three weeks at that point, um, that he hadn't followed up on some of the commitments he had made in our meeting. We're still waiting. So mm. although in some areas he's trying to portray this as a new administration. He says this a lot. He says, I, I took office you know, in January 2020, and from this time, yeah. this, this, and this has happened, and this hasn't happened in Malta. But from what we're seeing, nothing meaningful has changed yet, although he may be a bit less combative with some people than his predecessor, mm -hmm. um, although he did take a couple of hours to meet with our organizations, which we welcomed. Mm. At the heart of it, there are still really serious problems, uh, not just in this case, but with the press, freedom, climate in Malta. Mm -hmm. um, we raise those issues with him, the systemic, the climatic issues. Um, and, and again, you've mentioned Malta has tumbled 34 places down, mm -hmm. Reporters Without Borders, World Press Freedom Index. This is not going in a good direction. Yeah. He knows what needs to be done. There is no excuse now for continued stalled reforms. And what we're hearing on the ground too, um, under his administration, is that actually journalists are finding it more and more difficult to obtain information. Mm -hmm. So this is not just you know, an issue of the past with Joseph Muscat, his administration, Robert Abella's administration is continuing to be hostile and to withhold information uh, for, from journalists who are trying to do their jobs on things that are in the public interest. Mm. If I can, if I can yes, add please. to what Rebecca's saying, I mean, we're talking some like, we're really talking basics here. Mm. For example, 
um, our journalists at the shift are all internationally accredited. Mm -hmm. But we are not allowed to attend government events because you have to register with the, with the Department of Information, which is, which is under the office of the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. And they approve in every event whether you're allowed to go or not. And we are not registering because, I mean, it is, it is a fundamental principle that the government does not decide who is a journalist and who can attend a particular event. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we have battles, I mean, just on that basic yeah. level. And while, as, 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 as Rebecca is saying, the Prime Minister is saying, look, I've been here for these few months and look what has changed, the same person was uh, the advisor, was a member of cabinet, mm -hmm. and an advisor to the former prime minister, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the chosen one, he was put there and chosen mm -hmm. by the former prime minister, and he, and he promised continuity. It was, on, it was on the message of continuity mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. he was elected. So the, re the rhetoric has changed, mm -hmm. but in practice, not, nothing, nothing, um, nothing really has. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that is... Um, uh, if it's a difficulty and a challenge on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. We have somebody in the office whose only job is to send out freedom of information requests every day mm -hmm. because our questions are not answered. Yeah. They're not answered. So you send a freedom of information request. You have to wait 45 days. They wait till the last day. Mm -hmm. And then they can extend by another 45 days. So you are waiting. And then one out of, I don't know, 10 or 20 um, a request is actually um, accepted by the com by, by the uh, uh, by the information commissioner, mm -hmm. and when that happens, then the the government authority challenges the commissioner before the tribunal. This week alone, we have 18 cases before the tribunal. So these are decisions in our favour. So these are these are the few that we have, you know, managed mm -hmm. to get to get access. The commissioner has said they have a right to this information, and this week alone, 18 are before the tribunal. Mm -hmm. So the time that it takes, lawyers. Um, filing these reports yeah. and then and then you know challenging challenging these before the tribunal. I mean the amount of resources and time that and that that this takes. All of this is time taken away from proper investigations and yeah. proper journalism. They bog you down. They tire you financially. Mm -hmm. They tire you in terms of of, of your human resources. Mm -hmm. So so. And this is probably not what a lot of journalists or a lot of media. No, do we're the only one. We're the only ones doing this. Yeah. No, no, we're the only ones doing this because you can't run a newsroom in this way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's, I started from saying they, uh, they ask if I'm an activist or a, or a journalist. Mm -hmm. We don't have a choice. Yeah. We don't have a choice. I, we understand that this is not a new, the way a newsroom should be, should be run, but we can't do our job unless we, we, we work in this way. Mm -hmm. um, yesterday when we, when we uh, talked about the topic already, you said that um, um, Malta could be um, a blueprint for, for other countries when you look at the um, recommendations of, um, uh, of the, the public inquiry, if they are really um, implemented, because on the one hand, Malta is a very specific case, a very small country, but on the other hand, the problems that you are facing, that journalists are facing, are similar to problems that journalists are facing in, in many, um, many countries. Could you perhaps tell us a little more about that? Um, yeah, and in, in, in what way Malta could be a blueprint <coughs> for other countries? Yes, um, I mean, the sense is that um, there, ha there has been a deterioration since the assassination of Daphne Caruana Galizia in Malta and Jan Kuczak in Slovakia. Mm -hmm. Two other journalists were killed in the Netherlands and in Greece. Um, so while um, there are moves um, in, European, in the European Union to address the situation, um, like the Media Freedom Act, um, which will be implemented um, gradually um, until until next year. Uh, the pace of change, I feel, needs to be stepped up. Um, the public inquiry uh, is a world first, and that is thanks, as we said before, to the efforts of the family. The government fought that for two years. The government would, was was resisting the, the 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 holding of the public inquiry, and it is thanks to the family and the efforts of international organizations and the support of, of, of institutions like the Council of Europe that, that it was actually held. It is a world first. Um, and the panel of judges did a tremendous job uh, in terms of um, bringing facts forward, uh, in terms of the challenges 
that not only Daphne faced, but journalists continue to face in the country. And the recommendations are really a blueprint of what um, needs to be done to ensure uh, a climate in which journalists can do their work in the public interest, because the public is at the end of the day always the, always the goal. I mean, mm. public interest is always, we, 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 we work, um, we fight to ensure that we can hold power to account in the public interest. Mm. Um, and that is why it is so fundamental to democracy. Mm. Um, talking about the, the public, what, uh, what is the public opinion in, in Malta towards uh, independent journalists and media um, like, like yours? I mean, after the, the murder of Daphne, there have been uh, protests in, in, in the streets, so there, there is... Um, um, Yes, civil society is vibrant in, in Malta, but on the other hand, um, public opinion is uh, highly influenced by, um, yeah, by the state media and so on. So how, how would you describe that? Well, the state broadcaster has more or less ignored most, most of the developments in the country. It continues to be a voice only for, for the narrative of government. Malta, as I said, is very divided. Um, that is, it is divided across political lines. So we found in our investigation, for example, that, that the, the supporters of the party in government actually celebrated um, Daphne's assassination. Mm -hmm. um, we exposed all of this through the access that we got thanks to, to whistleblowers uh, on, and to the groups that they controlled. But on a positive note, uh, uh, a movement was born. Um, <coughs> because in a country where Protests are rarely held unless uh, one of the leaders of the pol political parties you know, raises the flag and says, take to the streets. Um, it was, it's really the, the, the first time that I can remember that um, uh, a movement that is really, really genuinely um, born from individual citizens um, um, moved forward and remained strong four years down the line. First thing they did was they set up a protest memorial dedicated to Daphne Caruana Galizia before the law courts in Valletta. That protest memorial was cleared every single night on orders of the justice minister. So people, so people would go and, present and place you know, messages and candles and flowers every day and every night the justice minister would order the clearing. Um, the Constitutional Court in Malta uh, found this to be a breach of fundamental human rights, yet this bore no consequence. He remains a member of cabinet. Mm -hmm. His answer to that was that, you know, um, it wasn't only my decision. The whole cabinet decided to do this, as if that was mm -hmm. some, 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 some kind of excuse. Um, Robert Abela, and that is one of the, small, the, the new prime minister, that is one of the small changes that he did, ordered, for, ordered this to stop. Mm -hmm. The fact that you have to order this to stop is an, in itself a sign that things aren't quite right. Mm -hmm. um, but still, the, uh, on the 16th of every month, which is the day that Daphne was killed, people gather in front of this protest memorial and they pay tribute to her. And that vigil, um, for even four years down the line, continues to be a sign and a message to the government that the people will never forget, that the people are still calling for full justice for her, and for the stories, and for her stories. That is why the message of Daphne was right um, continues to recur because, and that message is important, because all the hate that she faced, the dehumanization, the isolation, all of that was condoned as freedom of expression. If we have the right to criticize government, then we have the right to criticize you. It is no, it is not the same situation. Mm -hmm. Citizens criticizing the government is one thing. The government using the power that it has to silence citizens is not something. Citizens is something completely different. So, so that movement standing strong um, every 16th of the month, and also um, having managed to organize at the end of 2019 for two months, people were on the streets every day, almost every day, and that led to the resignation. Of, of the former Prime Minister, Joseph Muscat, who had won um, an electoral majority that was, quite, that was unprecedented in the country. Mm -hmm. So he was considered untouchable. But two months of protests organized by the civil society movement um, led to his downfall and the downfall of his closest states. They're still in government. The same it's the same mm -hmm. party in government, but it is still 
memorable, it is still a very significant achievement that, that somebody who, who felt that he was, you know, above democratic processes was, was kind of, you know, held to account. Mm. I just want to emphasize that point on mm. division because we can hear Malta is a divided society. I have to say it was quite shocking for me when I started to travel there, just how divided it is, because you think Malta's in the EU, it's a, it's this holiday spot, you know, that mm. many people would have known just from that. But like, I have never witnessed or experienced anything quite like it, just how deeply divided it is. It's so tiny, it's a fishbowl, that when you're walking around, Valesa <laughs> in particular, like if I go out to dinner with Caroline, she's recognized. I mean, we've been made to feel uncomfortable at the next table from so-and-so. If you walk around with Daphne's family members, they go, this is the person who sued Daphne for this, and this is that, and then like a minister will walk past you. This is, this is Malta, right? Mm. Um, I think it's easy to assume from abroad that working uh, for a campaign for justice like this or supporting it, you know, even from a voluntary perspective, some of the civil society activists, that this is a noble endeavor and it must be popular. Not in Malta. There is strong support for it, but there is also extremely strong derision. There are still uh, really appalling attacks on Daphne's family, on all of those who are involved uh, in the campaign for justice. There are those who perpetuate really nasty rumors um, and attacks. For example, that Matthew Caruana Galizia is somehow responsible for his own mother's murder. This is an online narrative that mm. often kicks off, which is really appalling. We know now about at least the acts of seven people in connection mm -hmm. with this murder. It's obviously nothing to do with Matthew. Mm. Um, it, I, have, I have personally been sworn at placing items on the protest memorial. I have seen the most vile things said to Daphne's sister. This, this, is, this is Malta. So mm. um, <laughs> that has to be addressed if any of this is going to change longer term. We've talked a little bit about civil society, but it's important to note that when Daphne was killed, there was very little civil society in Malta. Mm -hmm. This has almost all arisen now because of what happened to Daphne. This will really, I think, over the longer term, um, change the course of Malta's history. There's now stronger journalism. There's now um, grassroots activists' movements. There's now uh, professional NGOs shaping up that didn't exist before. Mm -hmm. And it is our hope at Reporters Without Borders that supporting these groups will help ensure um, broader reforms in Malta too, because again, this could still happen today. These climatic issues have to be addressed and it's not just about Malta. Um, one reason that we campaign um, so consistently and so vocally on this case is because it is emblematic and what is happening in Malta could happen in other countries too. Mm. We feel that if justice is achieved for Daphne and if these reforms are implemented, uh, again, that, that could show others how you can turn away from something like this and turn it into a positive rather than a negative. So Malta currently has that opportunity. We really at a crossroads. The public inquiry has led to this moment and if it is squandered, mm. that may be forever. This may be the, the only chance in, in the coming you know, future at least that Malta has to get it right. Mm. And the people of Malta deserve that. The people of Europe deserve that. And internationally, if we can ever get at um, impunity in any of these cases, it really will have a strong knock-on impact too in terms of safety of journalists. Mm. If one person even, if Jorgen Finnick, if the mastermind in this case uh, you know, is, is sentenced to the full extent of the law, that will make anybody that wishes to use violence to silence a critical journalist think mm. twice because... This was done in the full expectation uh, that there would be no justice for this case. And I very much hope that we, we prove those wrong, anybody who is involved in this. It's, it's really, it is really important to stress that this is, this is not only about Malta. That, you know, democracy in Europe is only as strong as its weakest link. Mm. Uh, so we, that is why we can't allow, you know, Malta to get away with this. And, and as I said, since Daphne and Jan Kuchak were killed, there's been more murders of journalists. So once you allow that impunity to reign, okay, we, that's why we must stop it in its, track, in its tracks. And Malta is, is a case where this can be done mm. because of the sustained effort that has been done over the last four years. A result is really possible in Malta. And that would really, you know, set, it's a way of setting the trend back, of, of countering that wave. And, and sending a message that this will not be tolerated in Europe. Mm. Um, thank you very much so far. I don't know if we have any questions from the, um, the audience online, maybe? Yeah, there's one question. Um, what can journalists, the civil society or the international community do to change something for the better in Malta? First of um, all, shall I answer? <laughs> um, the, the one very important thing is to make sure that the story is kept alive, that Daphne's name is never forgotten, 
um, and, that, and remembering that her cause represents the cause of so many other journalists who risk their lives every day to bring the truth to the public. To the public. So supporting, supporting the campaign, writing and, and commenting um, on the case, talking to your, to your members of parliament, to, to members of, of, of you know, the European Commission, etc., making sure that as, as Europe debates the future of journalism and press freedom, that, that we insist that this is a priority. Perhaps you want to add Absolutely that. that. It sustained the attention. Um, as I mentioned earlier, every time attention fades a little bit, you can feel it. The Maltese authorities are so uh, sensitive to their international image. Um, and, you know, the economic impact it may have. They need the tourism. They need this reputation uh, in many ways. Um, you see these moments where there's headlines and then the regression. So it's like, okay, I remember when uh, the whole yacht incident, when Jorgen Finnick was originally arrested, some of the international headlines were like, the mastermind has been caught. And then people just assumed that that was done. And people are surprised now. Uh, that was two years ago. People are surprised now that actually he has not yet been brought to trial. They just assume it's done and dusted. Mm -hmm. There's often these like misleading moments. So look beneath the headlines. I think journalists need to stick with it, stick with the reporting. Um, civil society, international NGOs are continuing to support all of these efforts on the ground. If there's other NGOs out there who would like to be involved, there's a coalition of us come, the more the merrier. Um, even ordinary people. I mean, there's, there's things that everybody can do. We can hold our own governments to account in keeping at this. Um, not just for Daphne's case, but like for, for everything that it represents, right? We all, we all have a role to play. Thousands and thousands of hours have gone into this campaign um, from Daphne's family, from those on the ground, from those internationally. And we are really determined to make that matter, to make it count, to make what, what happened to Daphne and her family have a lasting impact for the positive. So we need as much support as we can get. Are there any more questions online or maybe here in the room? That's good because I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Uh, uh, could you wait for the microphone yeah. just a second? Thank you. Could you speak about the way um, the legal system and lawsuits are abused in Malta to silence stories and uh, how, how recent developments in Europe with the anti slap legislation could, uh, could be used to remedy that? Yes. Um, there's, there's, there's different ways in which, in which the legal system is abused. First of all, Malta is literally crippled by a very inefficient judicial system. Um, until, until very recently, every, every member of the judiciary was appointed directly by the prime minister. So it's kind of potluck, you know, the magistrate you ended up, you, you ended up before. So that is also one of um, the, the, the positive um, achievements that, by civil society that they challenged that um, in international fora and there has been, and pressure has been applied. So there's, there's a different uh, system of appointment for members of the judiciary, even though the, the prime minister still holds a lot of control, the system has improved. Um, but what we find is because it is, so, it is such an inefficient system that it is easy for anybody to just sue you. Um, even if you know, what, what you're saying is true, it, they, they just sue you because that means they silence the story. Four years down the line, um, so that's four years of you know, presenting evidence before the courts and, and, um, and, and, and just the time that it takes to, to go through all this. And four years down the line, the case may be decided, but you know, the story is, is more than dead. Mm. Um, so the choice that you have as a journalist is to continue challenging that, um, this, despite what they do. On top of that, we've had, we've had the um, uh, Malta has been particularly hit by slap lawsuits. Um, the shift, at the shift, we were hit by, by a slap lawsuit only three weeks after, after we had launched by, uh, and it was a threat by Henley and Partners, the, um, the concessionaire of the, of the passport, the cash for passports program in, in Malta. And they said, they said, you know, take down the story. And we literally, we had just set up and we said, you know, this is about, I mean, either we comply immediately and everything that we were set up to do is dead mm -hmm. or, or we fight them all the way. And we were the first newsroom in the country 
to publish their threat in, in, in full, because what you get is this letter not for publication, and that's the threat. And, and when we published and showed people what was going on, then we realized that other newsrooms had already been receiving these kind of, of slap threats from different um, uh, international companies. And they were just pulling the stories and they weren't telling the public. So this, so we, so, so this in itself um, raised awareness um, about the problem. And all these companies were linked to deals with the government. That's important. So after, Daphne's, after Daphne was killed, they kind of took a step back and said we mustn't we mustn't be associated, you know, with 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 any kind of threat to journalists. Mm. But what was happening is they were doing it through these international firms, mm. and they were silencing the stories in that way. So when the shift went forward and and published this, and then we continued with with I think in four years received five <coughs> five or six of these threats, and we've always had the same response to publish the letter in full, and then to call for the help of international organisations to let them know that this is happening. And the, um, there has been a, a, a move by... Um, uh, in, there has an endorsement of a, a resolution by uh, in the European Parliament, I think it was last week or the week before. Um, and that is, that is a great... That's a big milestone. It's a huge milestone. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it really does offer... It, it calls for, for, for real protection... Um, for journalists in Europe against the, the, the threat of such... They're financially crippling lawsuits at the end of the day filed in foreign jurisdictions, mostly in the UK. You can probably elaborate on that. But, I mean, I consider that to be really fantastic news that finally the European Parliament has come together and said, yes, we have to move on this. Obviously, there's several levels that it still has to go through you know, with the European co uh, Commission, etc. But it is, uh, at the end of the day, a recognition that this is a problem and that something must be done. Perhaps you want to add? Yeah, that. certainly. Well, this is one area, too, that what happened to Daphne in the aftermath um, has really shaped how we all respond to these things internationally. I just came from a two-day anti-slap conference in London and it was mentioned several times how actually this case study of Malta and people like Caroline fighting back... Um, it really has opened a lot of our eyes to the extent of this. And now there is this really vigorous sort of anti-slap campaigning at the European level and in, in specific countries too because of what we know about this. So it's enabling people to fight back. So Caroline has just mentioned very matter-of-factly how she publishes every threat. This is really courageous and this is not the done thing, okay? This has been kind of an open secret in the media for years, not just in Malta, but internationally. An open secret kind of that these, uh, these threats exist, that they are an attempt to silence critical reporting, often even much bigger outlets than the shift just sort of quietly comply with these. And so um, I think there was years of that sort of stigma around speaking out. And I have to say, from country to country, it's very often the sort of trailblazing, really outspoken individuals who are, who are fighting this, who are uh, letting us know about these examples. And that makes it safer for everybody to start speaking at, about it. There's, there's strength in numbers. So um, there's some really interesting work happening. You mentioned uh, some of the European efforts. Um, I want to caution against one thing, which is in Malta, anti-slap legislation is coming. Okay. This is one of the things that the prime minister will say if you talk to him about what's being done on media freedom. Um, already what we see is a bit problematic, so that is worth very carefully scrutinizing. Don't just buy what's sort of how it's marketed. There may be a few aspects of things that we raise that are addressed, um, but there's bigger problems with it. So I think whatever is coming does need international scrutiny um, to do that. You mentioned London, Caroline. I will never miss an opportunity to name and shame some of the London law firms that are involved in these cases all around the world, which again, we're all tiptoeing around them. Name and shame. I mean, it's Carter Rock, it's Schillings, it's Mishkandarea, it's Taylor Wessing. Like so often we're seeing the same few firms involved. And there, some of these firms are not even really practicing law. It's reputation management, mm -hmm. right? But what they're doing is silencing critical voices in countries around the world, which has devastating impacts in countries like Malta. So enough is enough. I think the British public is not even largely aware that this is happening from London. Why is London the capital of these things? Um, I think we've all had enough and we're looking for creative ways to fight back. Well, thank you both uh, for being here and for your insights. And uh, yeah, thank you uh, here in the room and thank you online for, for watching. And everyone have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>